if you just keep the uh, keep the uh, direction of the needle and the tip in mind that way all you have to do is just keep your prop slightly moving slightly towards cephalid so that the needle is needle tip is always seen as a point going there and that way you can uh, yeah, avoid uh, wasting time you you have to if you're starting to use ultrasound you have to project it in your head as a three dimension so you have to have one cutting plane which is the ultrasound probe the second cutting plane which is your needle so you have to decide where it meets under the skin and you should be able to do that uh, doing that the other thing is just keep giving a little bit of saline you'll be pretty sure where your needle tip is even with a thin needle even with a thick needle you'll know where your needle tip is any other questions uh, if there are no questions we go on to the next fascia iliaca okay. block and dr har simran singh from united kingdom Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Balawenkar and Dr. Sundar, to give me this opportunity to come here and uh, present my technique of doing the fascia iliaca compartment block. We just had a very beautiful presentation about the femoral and the obturator nerve block. If I tell you that we, I can describe or we can describe a technique in which we can block the femoral nerve, the little cutaneous nerve of thigh, and possibly the obturator nerve with just one needle injection. Will that be interesting enough to keep us awake after a good Indian lunch? Hopefully. So I bring you gr greetings from Queen Alexandra Hospital at Portsmouth. It's not projecting. Why did you just get, uh, get my own thing out? So. So we're focusing our block on this new R-glass pattern recognition, which I have recently described. I'll bring you greetings from Queen Alexandra Hospital at Portsmouth, where I work. And I'll be basing the talk on how do I do it, but we'll discuss the clinically relevant anatomy along with it. So what is fascia iliaca block? It just involves putting in local anesthetic between fascia iliaca and its underlying iliacus muscle, in which the three nerves of the lumbar plexus run. It's a very low skill, simple, effective, and a reasonably reliable block to do. And this new technique which we have described, you just get your needle through the sartorius, point it towards the pelvic cavity, and then you have the spread of local anesthetic towards the lumbar plexus. You can use this block for anesthesia as well as analgesia for all your operations involving your hip, proximal femur, and the lumbar component of pain for your knee surgeries. So coming next to how do I do it, we'll discuss both the landmark as well as the supra-inguinal ultrasound-guided technique for doing it. So how many of you have done a landmark-guided fascia iliaca block? Okay, not many. So how many of you have done a supra-inguinal ultrasound-guided fascia iliaca block? Okay, so there is something new to learn. What I will do is we'll quickly scroll down the landmark technique and uh, then discuss the ultrasound-guided technique. The landmark technique was first of all described by Dr. Darlins in 1989. All we need to do is, if this is our patient, so if you're doing a right-sided uh, fascia iliaca block, we need to just identify the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, draw a straight line joining them, and divide into three parts. The lateral one-third, the lateral one-third and the medial one-third is the point where I would normally keep my index finger also helps in retracting the skin. The needle insertion point is about one finger, so they report about one to two centimeters caudal to that point. You can use a two-hees needle, or if you do have, then you can use a short bevel regional anesthesia needle. What we need to do is infiltrate some local anesthetic. I would enter the skin perpendic, I would enter the skin at a right angle, and once you have pierced the skin, you just change the angle to about 50 to 60 degrees. The first pop you feel is your fascia lata, and the second pop you feel is a fascia iliaca. So it's basically a two-pop technique. 
Once you have felt the second pop, you can normally give about 40 mils of quarter percent marcaine, which theoretically remains infrainguinally and blocks the little cutaneous nerve of the thigh, as well as the femoral nerve, with a success rate of about 70 to 90 percent in different studies. Just quick clinical pulse. Uh, if you're using a two-hes needle, it's sometimes worth just pressing your needle against the sterile uh, cover which it has on inside, which makes it a bit more blunt and the uh, appreciation of the fascial planes uh, improve. Always aspirate because it's a field block and you're giving a large volume of local anesthetic. So do always aspirate after every five mils. And the local anesthetic spreads even in about 20% of patients up to the lumbar plexus. So coming now to the more interesting bit, to do the fascia iliaca block with an ultrasound above the inguinal ligament. This technique was first time described by Dr. Bernard, who, uh, sorry, uh, described an Australian ED in 2011. And uh, we just gave another simplification of this technique by recognizing this hourglass pattern. It's a new technique for all of you, so we'll go very slow. So that's the paper represented in regional anesthesia. So all we need to do this block is recognize this pattern. Uh, as the previous speak, uh, speaker was just talking, that we always have some surrogate markers. We always depend upon our arteries to find our nerves. But this block just has these three nerves. So that's caudal, that's cranial. All you need to identify is th three muscles. So you have a sartorius hair, which forms the caudal part of the hourglass. You have your internal oblique, which forms the cranial part of the hourglass. And you have your iliacus muscle, which is a completely different fibers running in different direction, lying in there. And then the fascia iliaca, which can be seen covering the iliacus muscle. The disadvantage of not having any arteries and nerves become our advantage that we don't have anything in our needle trajectory that we can harm. So I'm going to discuss this block under four headings. The first of all, I'll talk about ergonomics. Then we'll talk about how to recognize this hourglass, then how to introduce our needle, and then what is a safe or a satisfactory deposition of local anesthetics. So that's my block room. That's our new fellow. So if I'm doing a right-sided fascia iliaca block, I'll start with a linear transducer, a high-frequency transducer, set at a depth of about 3.4 centimeter. My eyes probe, the needle will come from here, and the machine, they are all in one line. That makes the technique more easy. So we start by putting the probe on the anterior superior allex spine, pointing almost midway between the umbilicus and the ziphi sternum. So the minute we put our probe on the anterior superior allex spine, as we would expect, you get a picture like this because the bone is very superficial. And all we need to do now is just slide the probe towards the pubic tubercle in the same line that we had for our landmark technique. Let's have a look. So all I'm doing is just sliding the probe towards the pubic tubercle on the same line for about inch and a half. And this is our end point when we can recognize this hourglass pattern with the two muscles that we have discussed, sartorius internal oblique and our iliacus down there. So what I'm going to do next is run these two slides together. So we'll start from the anterior superior iliac spine. I'm going to move the probe down. So you start from the anterior superior allex spine. This is the kind of picture you get. And you move your probe just about for an inch and a half till the time you get to this pattern. You might need a bit of a lateral and a medial angulation to make the fascia and the underlying iliacus more prominent. Once we have this pattern in front of us, the rest of work is quite easy. So the needle is inserted in plane under the probe, with the probe being in the same direction. We have a lot of patients with big bellies, so if your assistant just retracts the anterior abdominal wall towards the other side, it will make your needling, as well as the positioning of the probe, much easier. Okay, so before I uh, go on to the video, let's have a look at this pattern again. So it should pass, sound a bit more familiar. So what if we take a parasagittal, actually an oblique parasagittal section, just where we have kept the probe, so you Get a picture like this. The only thing that the artist is for, he has just inverted the cranial quarter. So you have your sartorius, you have your internal oblique, 
and you have your iliacus muscle here, and you can see your ileum down there. So what we need to focus is this part of the, this anatomy. And if we have a look at both the slides now, so you see your sartorius there, you see your internal oblique forming that agra, you see a different kind of a muscle beneath them, that's your iliacus, and you do see the ileum which can be seen at that part. What I will do is we'll run this, the video and then we'll come back and have a look at the anatomy that will make things much clearer. So I've got this, a, pa uh, a patient who, uh, I'm just scanning, so this is sartorius, this is internal oblique, that's your iliacus. So my needle is going to come through the sartorius as we would expect as it was coming just beneath the probe. So we need to pierce the sartorius. When we come here, we're going to pierce the fascia iliaca. As it is a, a fascia, you will feel a definite give way when the needle is piercing the fascia. It norm the needle tom normally would tend to move a bit further, so I would normally retract it by a couple of millimeter. Just give one ml of local anesthetic, and this is what happens. With just one ml of local anesthetic, you can see we have just peeled away the iliacus muscle from its overlying fascia. So there are just two tricks with this block. Get your needle through sartorius, and while we are putting more and more local anesthetic, it is spreading down. Keep your needle tip always in view and in the lens of local anesthetic. And we can see the local anesthetic moving down towards the pelvic cavity. Again, I would use about 40 mils of quarter percent marking. Just continuing with this block because the machine only records one minute at one time. The other interesting thing to see in this uh, video while I'm injecting more local anesthetic is that the iliacus has now been compressed by this local anesthetic. And you can see a hill here. So there are two sides of this hill. So this is the pelvic side and this is the femoral side. So our goal is to inject the local anesthetic more towards the pelvic side so that it flows towards the lumbar plexus. And if we just reconsider the slides we have seen from the needle positioning, all this local anesthetic is going towards the lumbar plexus. Okay, let's have another quick look at the clinical anatomy. Can we stop this? I just need my screen on this. First of all, how is this hourglass form? So this is again the right side, anterior superior iliac spine, pubic tubercle. A probe is kept somewhere here. So you see the sartorius muscle starting from here, going medially. And if we have a look here, it is tapering here. So that is forming the caudal part of the hourglass. Then you have the flat part of the inguinal ligament. And then you have your internal oblique, which is attached to the inguinal ligament. As it is going to get attached there, it's going to form the another tapering that forms the cranial part of the hourglass. So if I take this internal oblique away, and just move it a bit. So what you see here, so that's the, the, the part of the ileum that we were seeing in our scan when we were injecting the local anesthetic. And you see the iliacus on both sides. So these are the two sides of that hill. So that's the femoral side, and that's the pelvic side. So the, the objective was that the needle with coming through the sartorius, we put more local anesthetic towards the pelvic side of the hill, which by gravity and mechanics would tend to move towards the lumbar plexus. And if I take off the ileus, the psoas major from here as well, so the local anesthetic is coming through here. We are pointing about, we are putting about 40 mils, which you imagine is two big syringes of 20 mil local anesthetic. It doesn't have much option to go there and block the nerves of the lumbar plexus. So this fascia iliaca actually is a very attractive alternative approach of doing an anterior lumbar plexus block. Uh, just need to do it again because they presented it in the continuous mode. Should I play the video once again after you have seen the clinical anatomy? Okay, so you're all with me in this slide. 
So this is our sartorius. This is internal oblique. We see our ileum here, and we see our iliacus, and the needle is going to come from this side. So again, the two same things. Get your needle through the sartorius. You'll feel a pop here. You normally need to retract it a bit to get into that exact plane to peel the fascia off. If you're doing an intramuscular injection, people have recommended that they do still work. But if you can get a, such a nice peel of local anesthetic, it gives you a very good and a very prolonged block, which would normally work for about 8 to 14 hours. Okay, coming next to the catheters, so as we have seen from the needling technique, it's much, uh, it's, putting in a catheter should be very easy. You can, if you don't have the, the specific regional anesthesia catheters, you can just put a two-hees needle and guide the normal catheter that you would use an epidural. Again, the end point or the goal should be to get the catheter tip uh, towards the pelvic side of that hill. So this is a patient, I've just done a catheter. I've already put about 30 mils of local anesthetic and about 10 mils, and you can't see any local anesthetic because it all descends with the gravity towards the lumbar plexus. And we can see our ileum here and the catheter sitting between the iliacus and the internal oblique. So what are the risks, side effects, and complications? The most important that I would worry is an intravascular injection because it is a high volume block. So we have to aspirate after every five mils of local anesthetic. Deep circumflex iliac artery is a very small artery which sits at the inferior part of internal oblique, between internal oblique and iliacus, that you might injure it and there's a, a, a rare chance of putting local anesthetic intravascularly here. But again, if we remember to keep our needle tip within the pool of local anesthetic that we are put in, it should be reasonably safe. If you do an intramuscular injection, there was a lot of discussion in last ISRA about the effects of intramuscular injection, but with the blind pop-up technique, I think we have been doing them for years. It's a supraingual technique, so there is always a risk of damage to peritoneum and the intra-abdominal organs. But there are a lot of things which would help us with that. You have put a probe there which is pressing upon the inguinal ligament. Then you are getting your needle through the sartorius, so the needle entry point is infra-inguinal and we're not moving the needle anywhere but in its own space that has been hydrodissected by putting in local anesthetic. So that should make it a very, very safe technique. Chance of nerve damage? I would say that's pretty negligible. So if you go back to that slide, so this is quite an obese patient and that, that point is almost the same point you would use for a, a landmark technique. And your femoral nerve would be somewhere here. If I put my probe in the same plane as the last speaker was using for the femoral nerve, the needle would normally not even come into the picture because it is m about two and a half inches away. I did do a pediatric patient and that's the only time. So the needle is exactly in the same uh, position as I used. I've just done a block and I've just turned the probe towards the, f uh, as we would do a femoral nerve block. So you can very clearly see the, uh, you can see the femoral artery and the femoral nerve. That's a local anesthetic. And now because we have changed the position of the probe, you can see the needle uh, as, a, um, in, as an out of plane uh, needle. And still, I think it's about inch and a half from, uh, away from the femoral nerve. The only other nerve is a little cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is a bit more medial. So this is a quite safe block from the chance of doing any nerve damage. So just concluding, the key learning points, the double pop technique of doing a fascia iliaca block gives a reasonable anesthesia, uh, so there should be nothing to stop us to do it in a patient who's come with a, a, a mid-femur fracture or a fracture neck of femur to give them a very good night's sleep, obviously taking care that you have all your uh, precautions and the resuscitation equipment wherever you are doing it. The new uh, supraingual hourglass fascia iliaca technique that we've described gives us a very attractive alternative of blocking the lumbar plexus anteriorly. And especially like Dr. Sundar was discussing a lot of uh, benefits that they have this morning. If you've got a, pa a patient who has been on certain anticoagulations in which you can't do an, a central neurexial block or perhaps even a posterior lumbar plexus block, 
the risk-benefit analysis will make this a very attractive option for doing an interior approach for lumbar plexus. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Harsimran, for your wonderful technique which you have shown. Uh, with your technique, if, if I could follow your technique, uh, with the traditional technique and your own technique, the, there's a difference in the anatomical landmark. Uh, one, one. Number two, you are twirling towards, more towards the pubic tubercle and then moving the probe on both ways and your depth of insertion needle is almost uh, five to six centimeter and then there's a pop-up and then you inject 2 ml of lignocaine and uh, so any local anesthetic and after piercing that you inject about 30 milliliter of local anesthetic. I think this is a technique which you are following. Yeah. So uh, the chances of uh, lumbar plexus block is 30 percent. 30 percent you said? No, no, no. Uh -huh. uh, if lumbar you get a very good peel off you will get a lumbar plexus block in all your patients. You said 30 no, percent. Okay. Uh, did I, nah, sorry, I, you must have. So if you uh, get a I very good have. peel off and you're putting local anesthetic, between, okay. as I showed, between the iliacus, and you, I do use an 80 millimeter needle. You're right yeah. on that. So you yeah. have to use a longer, longer needle, needle. Yeah. because that is the whole idea of doing. But it's still lesser than a 150 yeah, yeah. Uh, millimeter needle that you would be putting in a, someone's yeah. back and we don't even know where it is going. Mm -hmm. But the chances of having uh, of the... I don't have the figures right now. I'm still auditing our figures. Okay. Um, might be by next year we should yeah. have it. But uh, femoral nerve and uh, the little cutaneous nerve of thigh, there is no chance of missing it. Obturator nerve is still a bit, uh, we don't have the exact data how much we are getting in. Okay, but okay. Uh, those two nerves, there is no chance with that of technique you can miss. Them. Oh, you can miss them. Okay. Any question from the house? One uh, uh, little doubt I had when you're play, uh, moving your uh, probe uh, medially from the uh, uh, anterior superior iliac spine. Do you tilt the uh, probe or do you just keep it vertically yeah, the told, same direction? Every one of us is different. So what I yeah. would suggest is when you start doing these blocks, I do them for all my hip arthroplasty. So we used to do our lumbar plexus block and the spinal. Possibly some of you must be doing it here as well. But we stopped doing lumbar plexus block for about two years now. So they are the best patients. So in young patients, they're not that old as neck or femur fracture. You will have a very good differentiation of the muscles. And once you have done a couple of blocks, this block would become very easy. Coming next to that, as I already discussed, all, all of us are different and the uh, abdominal girth is different. So once you have reached that point where you can make out the iliacus appearing and two muscles coming upon that, you do need a bit of a medial and lateral angulation and a bit of an anisotropy, something like we use when we are doing a median nerve block in the forearm. And that just clears the picture much more. So you're right, you will need a bit of a medial and lateral angulation as I discussed. Uh, see, that's what I was telling. Uh, we have not. We are this, this practice. This, this, we are auditing it, but we don't have the numbers here. But it's a, it's a very safe technique. It's been being practiced since about 2011 in Australia. Most of the centres in England are doing it. Dr. Sundar was doing it. She had a very beautiful lecture this morning, and she's done it even in the paediatric practice. So that's very commendable. If people are following. Yes. Please. Even with an ultrasound, under ultrasound guidance, we see the iliosaurus and you see the needle and you thread in your catheter and if you're in the right plane, it kind of really threads up very well. But you can't see where it is going. But if you do in a cadaver, you can actually see it emerging near lumbar plexus and that is what you also feel by this approach. You feel you're coming close to lumbar plexus. So I want to know that what is the advantage in your approach because we have tried both. Okay, that's and I feel yours is like, you know, too close to the abdominal cavity, so we have the little apprehension. Uh, yeah. So what is the difference? Because I'm also hitting iliosaurus and I'm threading the catheter and I can see the nice hump of iliosaurus. And so I you're get doing the it in the femoral nerve block plane? No, so we don't do femoral nerve, we move laterally to femoral nerve and we see the swarth muscle and we go by the double pop plus the ultrasound guidance. So you're doing and it basically the same way, isn't it? So yeah. you're not seeing the, uh, what we basically described is that what you are explaining is that you see the iliacus 
uh, you might have a lot of experience in doing ultrasound, but when people start seeing it from inferior, so what Herbert explained initially in his original lecture was, you look for the anterior inferior ilex spine, the ileum which he described, then he said that look for rectus femoris, and then look for iliacus. That becomes a bit challenging when you're a beginner and you're on that steep curve of the ultrasound. So basically what you're doing is exactly the same as we would do. It's, it's a different approach of uh, getting to the same place where you're doing it. So the yes. result has to be the yeah. same because it's a different yes. approach so, of doing it. Though your article was very interesting, but Thank yes, the that little that. apprehension that we are very close to the abdominal Yeah, that cavity. risk is always there, but th again those same two points. Go through sartorius, so your entry point is beneath the inguinal ligament. And if you keep, because we are hydrodissecting here, isn't it? So we're not harming any muscle fascia. We're just hydrodissecting. And if you keep your needle, so if you see at all time, my needle was at least an inch and a half proximal to where, where my local was. So when you start, you might not go that deep if you don't have <laughs> confidence. You can just go towards the other side of the hill. And if you keep on lo giving local anesthetic, by gravity, it's going to go towards the lumbar plexus. As you get more and more experience, then you can obviously increase your... Uh, uh, length of needle insertion. But even if you go like something about three centimeters, once you're on the other side of that hill, yes. the local anesthetic will flow with gravity towards yes. there. Yeah. Next thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. I certainly learned this technique. Hello. Can I, can I also? Oh, no, you can't say that. Yeah. Uh, can I make a question? Yeah, sure. uh, Dr. Harshman, uh, you have shown in your slide that there is a possibility of abdominal content getting uh, uh, injured. Yeah. But in none of your slides, there was peritoneal sh peritoneal uh, peritoneum shown or abdominal content shown. So if they are not in your picture, how can you injure them? Or uh, how far away they are from your... Yeah, exactly. So I would say if, if I would scan about another inch away, then you will start seeing the bowel. So there is, when I'm, when I'm t describing a technique, I need to describe all the potential risks with that. So if someone keeps on going, going and going, so I would say if, if I would scan maybe it's tomorrow in workshop I can show you so another inch and a half if you keep on going towards because we're starting from here and if you keep on going towards we'll get towards a point where we will have the uh, the peristaltic intestines being seen so there has been one case report I think long long back where someone did a fascia iliaca block blind and uh, did a bladder rupture so we have to describe the risks when you're describing it yes please yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. I, I, this is certainly a learning process for me. I learned this technique from you. Thank you. Uh, but I, I think I want to uh, highlight the fact that you've been repeatedly saying lumbar plexus, lumbar plexus, uh, including uh, some of the other, other folks out there. Do you think the local anesthetic gets to the plexus, or you're just talking about the peripheral nerves of the lumbar plexus? The reason when you talk question about is, the plexus, uh, if I show you my talk, uh, what I normally do is my last topic is what I don't know. And no, no, I'm just asking the question yeah. because I think, from yeah. uh, from uh, from anatomical point of view, uh, I don't think your local anesthetic can get to the plexus because the plexus is within the psoas muscle. The nerves are formed and they exit the lateral edge of the psoas exactly. muscle, so it's and it's the uh, behind the, the pelvic fascia. fascia. So your local anesthetic is distributing posterior to the pelvic fascia and ascending in a cranial direction. So you're producing lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and your femoral nerve block and possibly an anterior branch of the obturator nerve block because you don't have data on the, uh, the yeah. complete obturator block. So I think saying lumbar plexus is, is incorrect unless you can demonstrate in a CT uh, study that at your, 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 your injected spets to that area. Because previous studies would, if you go by Cap de Villa's experience, Dr. McCare's uh, studies in, in the literature, uh, it's unlikely to get, it can go up there, but it's probably unlikely to enter where the, so, where the lumbar plexus lives. That's my, my point of view. Are you exactly right on that? I so that is to. the part which I say what I don't know. So there are two ways in which this block can work. It can work because after leaving from the lumbar plexus, the nerves do are in, the, are in the iliacus muscle, and they are, all the three of them, as I showed, are coming out of it. Yeah. The second thing is that even with the uh, Dallin's technique of a pop-pop technique, as I showed in that picture, which was taken with permission from him, there's a, he uh, documented, uh, he did an x-rays for which we could not get an ethics approval, probably much easier doing it in India. He did show that 20% of the patients, the local anesthetic was going in. But as far as with this block, whether it is actually going to the lumbar plexus, is I don't know. Okay. But it's a way to block the branches. It's a,
branches of the all three branches of the lumbar plexus. Just rather than the plexus per se, because to block the plexus, you have to inject it in the in the psoas compartment. And that makes it a bit safer as well. And we get the same mm -hmm. result with the needle trajectory being so safe. So basically, that does give because us the same result. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We are already running thank short you. of time. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Philip McCare. And uh, he'll be uh, telling us about uh, sciatic nerve block. He taught me how to do the sciatic nerve block the proper way. After that, I never realized that uh, the sciatic nerve uh, block was so easy till I learned it from him. Dr. Philip McCare. Thank you very much. Manoj, uh, very happy. That is the dissection made by uh, Olivier Choquet in 2002. And that is the injection by the three-in-one blocks that we call at this time the three-in-one blocks. That is the blue that you inject by the iliofascia block. And you can see that the obturator nerve is there. So it's impossible and I repeat, impossible to have a diffusion, to have a spread of the local anesthetic. We have the feeling that there is an obturator block because we don't know how to test an obturator block. So just the answer, anatomically, it was described by uh, Olivier Choquet many years ago. So my topic is not this one today. Uh, my topic, I think it's not this one too. Uh, I have to find it again. My topic is the static nerve block. Okay. So, our, the question was, how do I perform a static nerve block? And I think it's not very funny today to speak about the popliteal nerve block. Before that was that. Many, many, many approach. I think in each centimeter of the static nerve blocks, you had a description. Mansour for the parasacral, Winnie, Gardini, Shelley for the anterior approach, every, every centimeter. It was with the nerve stimulation. And now we make it very simple. We have these four approach, mainly four approach. I, uh, <laughs> ankle blocks for me are peripheral uh, distal blocks. We have the transgluteal, and there is a difference. Is there any difference between the transgluteal and the parasacral? Question mark, we have to prove it. The subluteal, but the subluteal is, I think, quite the equivalent of the popliteal. It's a very high popliteal. Of course, the anterior is totally different. And today I'm going to show you a very, very simple approach and very safe of the transgluteal. Just some anatomical uh, difference. You have to understand that sometimes the sciatic nerve normally is under the piriformis muscle but you can see that there is plenty, plenty of variation. So don't be surprised on the scan if you see the piriformis or if you see the sciatic nerve block in the middle of the piriformis. What do we need? Very simple, now we have these ultrasound machines. I don't have any conflict of interest, so I saw one machine, but I don't have any conflict, and I'm still using the nerve stimulator. Because sometimes on some very, very fat patient, you don't see anything, but you see the landmarks, the bone landmarks, and it will be very, very useful. So we're going to start, and everybody is able to recognize the posterior superior iliac spine, and if you have an obese patient, the ultrasound will tell you where is the posterior superior iliac spine. It's very easy. We can see it is a bone landmark, so it's a little mountain here with a slope. I like to ski with a slope here, which is the ilion. So you just put your probe at this place. You will see the posterior superior iliac spine, easy to identify, and you will see, normally, yes, and you will see this slope, which is the ilium. So as we're going to ski, we're going to go down. You see that my probe is horizontal, and I'm going to go strictly down, quarterly. And suddenly, I will have the posterior part 
of the bone uh, ischiatic, the posterior border of the ischium. So my line will be, I will have a rupture of the line and suddenly this echogenic point. That means that I have to turn my probe. That means for me, stop, you are the right level of the buttock, you just have to turn. So at this moment, I have two choices. I can perform a piriformis injection if I'm doing some pain procedure. I can do in a pudendal nerve block or I can do a sciatic nerve block. I'm going to describe the sciatic nerve block, so I'm going to turn my probe laterally. How do I turn my probe laterally? 5, 10, 15 degrees? I don't know. I'm going to extend this line, this echogenic line. I'm going to make it as much as possible horizontal. But most of the time, she's like that. But I try to extend this line. And when I extend this line, I will be very happy because I will see that and if, I, if you look a little bit, you don't need to use the echo Doppler, the color Doppler. Here, you will see a pulse, which is the gluteal artery. And if you see the gluteal artery, you see the gluteal nerve, the sciatic nerve, which is lateral. And I'm going to show on the videos. Okay, so we're going to start again the process. Very, very simple. I'm going down. I see my posterior superior iliac spine. I go down. I have the slope. I have the echo now. I turn my probe lateral, I extend this line, I extend this line, I'm happy, what do I see here? The pulse. And over, my sciatic nerve is there. That's it. This is very simple. On very fat patient, I will not see anything because I will have everything gray, but I know that I can put my needle there, I have no risk to go deeper because I will have a bone contact. So I just have to put my nerve stimulator in case of the sciatic nerve will be on the way to identify the sciatic nerve. If not, I just put my needle there, I inject some uh, dextrose, 5%, and suddenly the dextrose will create the space around the nerve and I will see the nerve and I can inject my, um, my local anesthetic. I'm living today in a country where the BMI, average BMI is like that, and we are performing this block on very fat patients, and it's quite easy. So we can do the puncture in plane or out of plane. This is an out of plane technique. Uh, this is an in plane technique, sorry. The out of plane technique will be the same. It, will, it has to be close to the probe to go directly on the bone contact to be safe and to go on the bone contact. I will show you a little bit also quickly the pudendal nerve block because it's so easy. Instead to go laterally, you go medially. And of course, if you go medially, you will have two, two targets. You will have the piriformis target, which is here. You can see the piriformis muscle. So, so if you have a spasm on the muscle, you can do toxin or you can do a local anesthetic, which will be very easy to perform. Or you can perform the, uh, the pudendal nerve block. It's an elegant way to perform a pudendal nerve block on a lateral position or on a lying position. We don't need any more to put the patient in later timid position. And we will do the block here. And we will have this image, the vessel, and that, the pudendal artery, and that you have the nerve. This is difficult. This is a nerve difficult to find. You need to have the color Doppler in this case to see the, the pudendal arteries. So, the plus of this technique, it's very simple. We have the posterior iliac spine. You will see it any type of patient. We don't need to have anatomical patient. The ilium is the slope, okay? Then after we will have the other, the second bone, bone landmark, which is the posterior border of the ischium. Then you turn laterally to make this white line horizontal as much as you can, and you will have this image with this pulse. Normally there is a video, no, sorry. You have the pulse here, okay? And you are here, you have the, this is the vascular landmark, you have the gluteal artery that you can see, and lateral to the gluteal artery, you will have your sciatic nerve. That is medial, that is lateral. So there is no risk, I told you, because we are 
at the level of the sperm, so there is no risk to go inside the pelvis. I don't want, I want to make this approach extremely safe to be used like a, by a junior or by a senior, okay? It's a difficult, uh, all the parasacral approach that I can read or that I was performing in the, in the, in the, in, uh, previously were difficult, so were reserved for senior anesthesiologists. That can be done really by a junior anesthesiologist if he's able to follow the needle. When you go to the literature, there is a similar uh, technique described by uh, Mohamed Taha. The problem, the main problem, that is performing the block here, is putting the probe here. So he's performing just in the part where you have a big hole and where you can go to the pelvis and he's describing himself the, possibly, the, the possibility of this complication. Here, you have a lot of traps, you have the rectum, you have the ear tear. So I think this is not the good level to do it. You just have to go two centimeter lateral and colorly and you will be, I think, much safer. In two words, you have uh, the posterior superior lacrimal spine. One more time, you go down, you have that. As soon as you have the rupture of the line and that, you turn your probe laterally and you will, or immediately, and you will have two options. And I think that's finished. You try to extend, you are here. We submit an observational study. Uh, we are waiting the results. That's it, I think, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McCare. Any doubts, any questions? Doubt? They are not allowed to have <laughs> any doubt. Yes. We get the benefit, the difference between this block and the popliteal block or the subluteal block is that we have uh, the uh, inferior gluteal nerve, we can block the inferior gluteal nerve. So we'll have a better analgesia in terms of hip, uh, knee replacement, we will have a better tolerance of the tunicate and we will have a better uh, proximal approach. That's the only difference. And sometimes I'm in a trauma center Sometimes you have the patient who arrive with the uh, atella up to the thigh. So the popliteal approach is not possible. It's a very easy approach. It's easier for me than the subluteal approach on a obese patient. Because on a obese patient, the subluteal, you need to see the ischiatic spine. And then after you need to see the great trunk anterior, you can see that. But most of the time, you don't see the nerve. So you are doing the puncture blindly, even under ultrasound. Here you have these bone landmarks who are extremely easy to identify. Yes? Any, any position, uh, lateral uh, decubitus or prone position. Of course, at the beginning, your learning curve will be faster if you start on prone position, but very quickly, it's, it takes time to put a patient, and especially some uh, overweight patient on prone position, so very quickly you shift on a lateral position. And the volume you, we, you, you, we can uh, inject is around 12 ml. It's a very, very small volume. So as we're going to combine this block yeah, sure. with probably a femoral, yeah. probably an obturator, and why not a cutaneal lateral of the yeah. thigh, we need to reduce the volume, and with 10 or 12 ml, it's, it's really enough. So we call uh, Anid. Yeah. Next, thank Thank you. <clears throat> now the last block of the evening, ankle block by Dr. Amjad Maniar from Bangalore. Uh, 
Right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm left with the difficult task of telling you how to block five nerves in 10 minutes. So I'll probably rush through things, and I'm going to assume that most of us know about a very popular block, the ankle block. And as we know, it's indicated for surgeries on the foot. Now, very quickly, it's a block involving five nerves, the superficial peroneal, the deep peroneal, the tibial or the posterior tibial, it's called in different names, and the sural nerve. These are all branches from the sciatic nerve, the terminal branches of the sciatic nerve. There is one orphan there from the femoral nerve, the terminal branch of the femoral nerve, the saphenous nerve. All right. And if you look at literature, people will quote success rates of this block up to 100 percent. And uh, Perhaps you all know that it's a very simple block to do with good success rate, especially in really high-risk patients. But there are some problems with the landmark technique. More or less, when you look at the different ways it's done, you can, I'm, I'm going to be honest about this, it's more like a glorious ring block around the ankle. We just feel for things and we inject a large volume of local anesthetic there. We don't know if that hypodermic needle, most of you do use a hypodermic needle, whether that hypodermic needle goes through and cuts through the nerves, because most of the patients who you're doing an ankle block are already kind of neuropathic. Local anesthetic dose, 20 to 40 ml. That's the numbers that have been told. It's, it's a little bit ridiculous to be giving 40 ml for the nerves, and I'll show you why. And most of the patients who would be indicated to have, uh, to, uh, to be, who is going to get an ankle block are going to have uh, an edematous or a cellulitic ankle. So you don't really always have clear access to the ankle. So when you use ultrasound, let's see what ultrasound can actually do to help us give this block. We can, as ultrasound always does, accurately deposit the local around the nerves. And there, when you, you'll see when I show you some videos later that there's a really big reduction in the volume that you use for giving the block. And the best part about the ankle block with ultrasound is you don't need to limit your technique to the ankle. You can, if you have an edematous ankle or some cellulitis there or some ulcer there, you can actually trace the nerve upwards and give the block slightly distal. So the problems with ultrasound, as always, these nerves are extremely tiny. At some places, you'll find some of the nerves being just about a millimeter or two millimeter in size. So scanning them can be extremely problematic. Do we have a, you know, a fair technique described? Some people advocate a mix of landmark technique and ultrasound-guided techniques. And the, the ankle is a fairly compact and circular structure, and our probes are usually anywhere from 25 millimeters if you, if you have the small probes, but on average everybody has the 38 millimeter or the 50 millimeter probes. These don't sit very well, don't make good contact with the ankle, so you get a lot of artifacts. It's not too much of a concern. The other thing is, no matter how quick you think you are, uh, it's going to be quicker to do a block, an ankle block with the landmark technique as opposed to the ultrasound technique. The ultrasound technique does take a little bit of time. Whether you can work around it remains to be seen. So very quickly, I'm just going to tell you how I do it. I'm not going to get too much into the details of anatomy. Okay. Obviously, it's going to be with ultrasound. Right now, remember there are five nerves to be blocked. So the patient actually tosses around on the table quite a bit. To block the tibial and the saphenous nerve, I like to keep my patient this way, with his legs crossed over onto the other legs. There's a reason for it. The nerves, the posterior tibial nerve lies around here behind the medial malleolus, and you need to block the saphenous, which is on the other side of the malleolus. So keeping the patient in this sort of position gives me, one, the ergonomics to place the machine away right in front of me and for me to approach with the needle from here we're keeping the probe there. It also gives a little bit of lift off the foot, off the uh, level of the bed so that I have some place to put my needle and syringe. With the superficial peroneal and the deep peroneal nerve I like to place the leg this way. This gives me clear access to the front of the foot and to the side, to the lateral border of the leg where I like to block the superficial peroneal. For the sural nerve, the sural nerve, I need to turn the patient lateral and expose 
the part behind the lateral malleolus. For equipment, I like to use the highest frequency probe. These are all extremely superficial blocks and the nerves are really tiny, so I want good resolution on my probe. I could use that 50 megahertz probe that we heard about this morning. Uh, what we have available is we have a 38 millimeter probe and a 50 millimeter probe. The 50 millimeter probe goes up to 15 megahertz. Occasionally, I will use a hockey stick probe, but the resolution isn't just as good. The needles that I would use are either a 25 millimeter or a 50 millimeter block needle. Sometimes I will do this with a hypodermic needle, but I do not recommend you do it with a hypodermic needle unless you've re reached a fair bit of competency. How much uh, local do I use? About 2 to 3 ml per nerve and maybe about 5 to 6 ml for the tibial nerve because it's the largest one, largest nerve in the ankle. Right. So the problem, like I said, is the nerves are really, really tiny. But there is a workaround to it. Most of the nerves are accompanied by the landmark that we were just talking about. Okay. Almost all of them, four of them are accompanied by a vascular structure. And only one, the, peri uh, the superficial peroneal nerve does not have a vascular structure consistently close to it. So I'll tell you how to do it uh, otherwise. In case you don't see the nerves, it's good enough for you to do a perivascular injection if you can image the associated vessel that it's lying with. So if you do remember anything from my lecture today, please remember this. The tibial nerve is closely related to the posterior tibial artery. The deep peroneal nerve is related to the anterior tibial artery. The sural nerve is related to the short saphenous vein. The saphenous nerve is related to the great saphenous vein. And the superficial peroneal nerve, it doesn't have a vascular landmark which is consistent, but it lies between the peroneus brevis and external digitorum, uh, extensor digitorum longus muscles. And I'll tell you an easy way to identify this muscle. Right. Very quickly, like I said, we are looking behind the medial malleolus. I'm using a hockey stick probe here. And the line here indicates where the posterior tibial artery would be. I would scan at the artery, trying to identify it first, and scan up and down till I get a fairly clear picture and a fairly clear sight. So this is where the posterior tibial artery is, accompanied by a vein. And the nerve is always located close to it, either beside it or under it. It depends on where you're scanning. Right? It's very easy. This is the easiest nerve to sight because it's the largest nerve at the ankle. Now if you just look, now like Dr. Kamaka was saying in the morning, this is actually my ankle, it's pristine. But when you're giving an ankle block, you don't get the prettiest ankles around. So you get a picture which is really edematous. This patient had peripheral vascular disease. The posterior tibial artery is right over here. It doesn't even pulsate very well. But you can get over it in this block because the nerve is really large. So you can see the injection happening here. There's a needle there, a bit of fill around the nerve. So this is the tibial nerve that you have there. And you can see there's absolutely a little bit of pulsation there, not a very good leg. The saphenous nerve. Again, the landmark, the great saphenous vein, so we're scanning on the other side of the medial malleolus, just looking for the vein. Now the problem with scanning veins is even the weight of a light transducer like this will compress the vein. So you don't always get great pictures. The saphenous nerve at the ankle at this point would have divided further. And sometimes there's also a question whether there's any role of the saphenous nerve below the ankle. So this is where you would likely to do the injection. If you don't see a nerve, which is more or less the case most of the time, just do an infiltration around the vein, which is what you're seeing here. I'm just putting in a hypodermic needle and injecting around the vein. This should be good enough for you to get a saphenous nerve block going. The superficial peroneal nerve, like I said, this is the one nerve that doesn't have a consistent vascular landmark. So I like to change the position of the patient, 
keep the leg this way. And there are two muscles you're looking for, the extensor digitorum longus and the peroneus brevis. And if you scan between them, you're going to look for this sort of picture. Now, how do you, how do you identify which muscle is what? Now, the peroneus brevis has a very distinctive sign inside it. You see this little thing there? This is the tendon of the peroneus longus. It's almost always there. So it's very easy to identify the peroneus brevis. Beside it lies the extensor digitorum longus, slightly anteriorly. Now, in between these two, under the deep fascia, lies the superficial peroneal longus. It's a really tiny one, and if you do the trace from up to down, you can see the nerve going more and more subcutaneous. By the time it reaches the ankle, it's gone almost subcutaneous, and that's how the technique is described for an ankle block with the superficial peroneal nerve. You're just going to do a subcutaneous injection. Okay, to see a block, this is, again, you can see the tendon of the peroneus longus, the peroneus brevis, the extensive strotum longus, and you can see the nerve here, You're just under the fascia. Most of the time, you need to smoke these nerves out. They're all under hiding, and once you put a bit of fluid around there, you can see it a lot better. So this is the nerve here. If you measure these, these are about two, one, two, three millimeters, that's about it. The deep peroneal nerve, things get a little bit easy because we're back to spotting an artery. Usually lies just beside it. If you don't see the nerve, once again, it's been described that you can just do injections around the artery to get the deep peroneal nerve down. Okay, I'll show you a video. You can see the arterial pulsations here. This is the deep peroneal nerve. Okay, again, very, very tiny. This requires you to have a very steady hand and a lot of patience in trying to find the nerve. The last nerve is the sural nerve. And at this point, I've turned my patient lateral. And I'm scanning below the lateral malleolus, and I'm looking for the sural vein. Sorry, so sorry, the short saphenous vein. And beside the short saphenous vein lies the sural nerve. Again, not very well seen till you inject. You can see the injection here and look closely over here. This is the vein. And this is the nerve right over here. See a well-defined round structure there. That's a sural nerve. Okay. Summarizing this, with ultrasound, you can have precise deposition of the local anesthetic around the nerves. And you can do this block slightly higher than you normally would. It's, it's probably a modification and the evolution of the ankle block for us to uh, improvise and do it this way. You can also use the, uh, the ankle block for selective nerve blockade. That is, you don't need to block all five nerves. You can select which nerve you want to block and identify the osteotome, the dermatome, the myotome, and precisely block what you need to. And like I said, this is an evolution of the ankle block. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Any comments, any queries from the house? I don't know how many of us are giving ankle blocks via ultrasound technique. Very few, no? <laughs> so, anybody? No, if there are no questions, Sir, uh, I thank all the speakers. Sir, excuse me. Anybody? So yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Please go Madhav ahead. Swami. Uh, these nerves, uh, all these nerves are unmyelinated nerves. Uh, have you seen a permanent damage being caused to any of these, during any of these blocks? Uh, not during the blocks, but I would no, say that no. Not during the block, uh, in the long run. Not, see, most of the patients who we would wind up giving an ankle block to already have some sort of neuropathy going on. So it would be really difficult to trace back and 
Uh, because you know, the, like uh, this is a lovely uh, ankle block is a lovely thing to do, but it hasn't become that popular just because of this simple reason. I personally feel that uh, these are unmyelinated nerves, and we may damage them. It's possible. It's possible with the blind technique that we've been putting, you know, needles in there. We've been putting a lot of local in there. Uh, but I don't know, I, I haven't encountered anything with the ultrasound blocks. Again, it's not the most popular block. Uh, most of our patients would not tolerate five injections around the leg. They would think you are a very bad doctor if you did that. I would actually go and do the pop lethal, which is a lot quicker. Uh, but yeah, point noted. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, I thank all the speakers for the innovative videos. I also thank the audience for the patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not breaking for tea. In the interest of time, we are going to continue with the next session. Uh, I'm sorry, we're running very late. For those of you who would like to stay for the session, I'm going to announce we're now going to go ahead with uh, emerging trends. And I would like to invite our chair chairpersons, Dr. Adarsh Swami, Dr. Raj Tobin, and Dr. Pavan Guha, Guha, sorry, to the dais, please. Dr. Adarsh Swami is the head of anesthesiology at Fortis Mohali. Dr. Raj Tobin is the head of anesthesiology at Max Hospital Saket. And Dr. Pavan Guha is the uh, head of anesthesiology at Batra Hospital in Delhi.